August 1945. At a memorial on Singapore's seafront, the words Ittefaq, Ahmad, Qurbani etched on its three marble pillars. Unity, faith, sacrifice, the motto of the Indian National Army. A small group of people stand in silent homage. The tricolour with the charkha flies at half-mast. Major General Muhammad Samakiani places a wreath on the INA Martyrs Memorial. A wreath in tribute to the man known simply as Netaji, to thousands of soldiers of the Indian National Army and to an entire nation. Now mourning his death in an air crash on the 18th of August. Barely two weeks after this moving ceremony, the Martyrs Memorial was dynamited by the British forces when they recaptured Singapore. My uncle was in the eye, and I remember him telling me, many Indians in Singapore came quietly at night to collect the fragments of the shattered memorial. And 50 years later, the Singapore government erected this marker and since then, this site has been a pilgrimage site for many of the Indian visitors paying homage to one of their beloved leaders. So that's why you brought me here. I'm sure you know Netaji's story, right? But do you know Singapore played an important part in his story? Singapore occupies a unique place in the annals of the last war of Indian independence, the Azad Hind movement and the Indian National Army, which was led as its supreme commander between July 1943 and August 1945 by Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. This is so fascinating. How did the last war of Indian independence start on the soil of Singapore? And do people here still remember Netaji and his army? And how did Netaji even choose Singapore as theatre of his war against British imperialism? Well, Netaji's Singapore saga started with a rather dramatic event. Selva's narrative begins in British India in the city of Calcutta. For long the stronghold of the British Empire in India and its capital for 140 years. It was also a place where ideas of freedom and nationalism captured the imagination of many Indians. One of them was a young man named Subhas Chandra Bose born into a wealthy and influential Bengali family, Subhash joined the Indian freedom struggle at a very young age. His fight carried on in India for over two decades, starting from 1921, a period that shaped Subhash and his ideologies. He was arrested frequently, imprisoned for long stretches, and even forced into exile by the British. He was also elected twice as the president of the Indian National Congress. In January 1941, he made a fateful move. A move that was the start of a remarkable chapter in the story of the Indian freedom struggle. A move that led him through Europe to Singapore. That was the great escape. The British had kept Subhash under a strictly monitored house arrest at his family home on 38 by 2 Elgin Road. 
the early hours of January 17, 1941. He made an audacious escape from here in a wanderer, driven by his nephew, Sishir Bose. Subhash eventually reached Europe. His plan was to set up an Indian government in exile there. He also wanted to create the Azad Hind Forge, a free Indian legion, a force made up of Indian prisoners of war. But the war suddenly took on a new dimension in the East, with the British surrender of Singapore in February 1942. From that point onwards, Singapore emerged as the epicenter of what became the Azad Hind movement, led by Netaji, from 1943 to 1945. The Indian soldiers who were part of the surrendering British Army formed an Indian National Army the first INA. This set the stage for the Azad Hind movement in Asia. The first INA floundered, and by the end of 1942, it became moribund, principally because of a lack of leadership. Now, that problem was resolved once Netaji, after his epic three-month submarine journey from Northern Europe, finally arrived in East Asia and reached Singapore um, to mass acclaim. Bose arrived in Singapore on 2nd July 1943 and received a rousing welcome at the Kalang Aerodrome. Indian National Army Commanders J.K. Bhosle and Mohammad Zama Kiani received him at the airport. The INA soldiers gave him a guard of honor. The Kalang Aerodrome is no longer operational. But this building is very much a landmark in modern Singapore, as it was in the past. Selva tells Janaki it was here, at the Cathay building, that Netaji made his first public appearance in Singapore. He was formally introduced on 4th July 1943 as the new leader of the INA by Rash Bihari Bose, another great Indian revolutionary leader in exile. Well, I have brought for you this present. Sri Rash Bihari Ji Bose, Purvi Asia Ki Jange Azadi Ki Numayan Lo, Daino Ad Bhaiyo. मैं आप लोगों के दीदी इस तकबाल के लिए और साथ ही साथ आपने जो मुझको पूर्वी एशिया की जंग आजादी के नेता बनाया इसके लिए भी तय दिल से आप लोगों का शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ क्योंकि अब ये वक्त निहायत नाजुक है मैं इस जिम्मेदारी को कबूल करता हूं और खुदा से दुआ मांगता हूं कि उन्होंने हमें वो ताकत वो जोश और वो बहादुरी दें
जिससे हम अपने हम वतनों की पूरी पूरी मर्जी के मुताबिक लड़ाई लड़ी और हिंदुस्तान को आजादी पहुंचा डे आफ्टर दैट इंस्पायरिंग स्पीच है वे कहते नेताजी केम टू दिस फील्ड नोन एज द पडांग टू एड्रेस द आई एन ई ट्रुप्स फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम वाई ह्योर because this place has always played an important role in the story of singapore history says that a king called sanga nila uttama spotted the legendary singer or lion here in 13th century he established a kingdom here and called it singapura 500 years later stamford raffles set up a trading post in singapore The sepoys of the British East India Company who came with him set up camp here on the Padang. On 5th July, history was once again made here at the Padang. More than 15,000 soldiers of the Indian National Army assembled here to hear Subhash Chandra Bose for the first time. Netaji called it the proudest day of his life. So Janaki, imagine the scene. Netaji stands here and announces to the world that India's army of liberation Azad Hind Fauj had come into being. Inqilab Zindabad Azad Hind Bose gave them the battle cry Delhi chalo Just a few weeks earlier, Bose had given a series of inspiring radio broadcasts from the region. Our has struck, and every patriotic Indian must advance towards the field of battle. Only when the blood of freedom-loving Indians begins to flow, will India attain her freedom. Bose expanded on that idea during his next rally at the Padang on 9th July. He addressed a crowd of over 60,000 people. These weren't just INA soldiers, but also thousands of civilians. He called on the 3 million Indians living in East Asia to mobilize all their available resources, including money and manpower. Half-hearted measures will not do, he thundered. I want total mobilization and nothing less. Tens of thousands of civilians from the Indian and Indian origin communities throughout Southeast Asia from that point on volunteered to join the Indian National Army as soldiers. They were trained and they became active freedom fighters as well. मेरे पिताजी श्री राम मोधराय सेकेंड लेफ्टिनेंट थे आज़ाद हिंद फौज में मेरे पिताजी उस रैली में थे मेरी नानी जी भी उस रैली में थी पिताजी हमारे ठीक ठाक थे अच्छा धंधा पानी था उनका लेकिन जब देश को ज़रूरत पड़ी तो भी निकल लिए जॉइन किए आज़ाद हिंद फौज आज़ादी के लड़ाई में कूद पड़े The amazing thing was that my father had come from India, Bellur, but he never went back. He, he, you know, it was a family of ten, but none of us knew had been to India, and yet the connection was there, made by the um, Swachandra Bose and his exploits. We came to know how deep. both my brother my father 
felt for the Indian National Army. There was a photo of Subha Chandra Bose in my house as long as I can remember. This was in Malaysia, a place called Kuala Lipis. And my eldest brother, Chakravani, he left his little village and came to Singapore. And then again he joined the, joined the INA. And to that we lost, uh, lost track of him for nearly about a few, few years until the Japanese left. Then he came back. Author Nilanjana Sengupta recalls her meeting with Kishore Bhattacharya, yet another of those drawn to the INA. He was a youngster when Netaji came here and he had joined the Balak Sena. So what he told me is that the first time he was at a camp in um, Singapore and uh, he, Netaji came to visit them. And he was the only youngster among all the other adults. So Netaji kind of obviously spotted him and called him and asked him his name. So he says Kishore Bhattacharya and um, Netaji was quite pleased apparently and said that in Bengali, Tumi Bangali, are you a Bengali? And uh, when Kishore nodded his head, um, he kind of encouraged him and said that, you know, this is the path that we need to take and devote your life to your country. You will never know any other mission which can satisfy you more. But otherwise, I must specify that uh, Netaji had no kind of positive bias towards the Bengalis. Um, he was always very keen to work with every other part of India and uh, particularly the Tamil community over here, um, he had very strong bonds with. Members of the Tamil community settled in East Asia flocked to listen to Netaji's speeches. These were translated into Tamil for them by M.K. Chidambaram. So from July 1943 onwards, the Azadhan movement, thanks to Netaji's inspirational leadership, assumed the proportions of a mass movement. It was no longer simply a military force. The man who, who really brought the image of a post-war Netaji's legacy was Mr. Nathan. He had heard uh, Netaji talking of giving in his oration at the Padang. And so he became a nimit and it became a lifelong pursuit to, 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 to do something about his legacy. This is what is remarkable, that a man could inspire people who had never been to the motherland, and yet there was this you know, urge to do something. The thing about Netaji is that he wanted to show uh, the people of Singapore that there was an alternative to the British Raj model for Singapore. Think as an anti-colonialist to the core of his heart. Netaji tried to convince Singaporeans, including those who are not Indian, that there is an alternative. At the 9th of July rally and at the women's meeting shortly after, Bose brought up one of his most cherished ideas. The active involvement of Indian women in the battle for freedom and the formation of a women's regiment. Present on these occasions was a young doctor named Lakshmi Swaminathan. Subhash Niali, Dr. Lakshmi's daughter, tells us how Netaji convinced those who were initially not in favor of this idea. He didn't agree with them and he said, you just find one woman who can be developed into a leader and then you see what we do. You don't know Indian women. And he said that they are very, once they decide to do something, then they are, you can't move them. You, they, don't, uh, they don't surrender. Subhash Ali recalls the story of how her mother, Dr. Lakshmi, came to be associated with Netaji and the Rani of Jhansi Women's Regiment of the INA. So then he said, what about that lady doctor who came to meet me? Why don't you send for her now? So she came at night. And then he immediately put this proposal and she was so excited because she was actually feeling that there's no role for her in all this excitement that was surrounding her and there was nothing for her. So she immediately agreed and said that nothing could be more, you know, but what I would like to do than that. So then he said, well, when can you start work? She said, tomorrow. What about your practice? And no, should I just put a lock on my clinic? And uh, she started, the next morning they found her an office 
and then you know that office be, uh, was improved and then she was given a ground and then the recruitment started and it's very interesting because netaji was so involved that he would go with her also or take her with him to different parts of southeast asia where would, they would appeal for women to come forward most of the recruits came from very uh, poor fam- backgrounds and most of them were south indians kerala and tamil nadu about i think 75% they were the ones who came and became ranis <laughs> The girls presented the guard of honor to Bose on 12th July. It was only 24 recruits at that stage, led by um, Dr. Lakshmi Swaminathan, who came to be known as Captain Lakshmi from that point onwards. and the women were still dressed in saris they had long hair but they were carrying uh, 3 not 3 lee enfield rifles that they had been trained to handle by male ilae officers a big part in organizing the women at this stage was played by a lady called daisy chidambaram daisy chidambaram a very interesting figure um she was one of the rare women in the south indian community of singapore who was very well educated at that time she was um educated in a convent she had learned both french and english and very active in the kamla club so obviously she was quite a well known face in the indian community here and uh, it is not very surprising that netaji contacted her one of the first women to be contacted in singapore to start the rani of jhansi regiment though of course daisy never became a part of the army she remained in the background and organized all the events the cultural events um, that were organized at the jalan besar stadium gradually other young women also joined the regiment meri mata ji रानी झांसी रेजिमेंट में ज्वाइन हुई थी माता जी को मेरी नानी जी ने ही ने प्रेरित किया था कि देश को ज़रूरत है जो भी कर सकती हो करो आगे बढ़ो और ज्वाइन करो पंद्रह सोलह साल की रही होंगी उस समय ये लोग ज़्यादातर उस समय जैसे सिपाहियों को जो चोट वोट लग जाती थी फर्स्ट एड का मदद करती थी जाकर पानी पिलाती थी और जगह जगह जैसे अगर कहीं रैली वगैरह ऑर्गेनाइज हो रही है तो ये लोग जाकर वहाँ मदद करती थीं जुलूस भी निकालती थी जैसे मार्च निकालती थी और लोगों को प्रेरित करने के लिए इन सब इन लोगों का रोल उस समय वो था क्योंकि वे बच्ची थी द स्टोरी ऑफ लक्ष्मी इज डेप्यूटी कमांडर इज ऑल्सो एन इंटरेस्टिंग वन जानकी देवर जस्ट एटीन वॉज फ्रॉम एन एफ्लुएंट तमिल फैमिली ऑफ क्वाला Uh, many stories have been told about that how she uh went to the padang and uh, heard him speak and how she had told uh, my grandfather that uh he that you know she was just going for a bicycle ride but um then she spent pretty much the whole afternoon waiting for him The young Janaki was so moved by Netaji's words that she even gave away her gold ornaments when he called for donations and volunteers. She and a group of girls then signed up for the regiment and left to train in Singapore. There were a group of um Tamil uh young lady Tamils all educated in convents. There was um somebody called Devani and then her sister then there was my mother's sister called papati they seemed to have uh, grouped and joined and the instigator behind this was my mother so um uh so she was obviously sufficiently moved and so she 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 got my grandfather to agree because all these girls were going as well and um uh but i don't think my grandfather could have dissuaded her in any case any event because she was she was quite a willful person and strong minded 
and um, remained that way all her life. So this is where the barracks of the Rani of Jansi Regiment were located. And this place was organized by Attavari Yallappa, who was the president of the Indian Independence League in Singapore. And that's the Singapore Arts Museum. In those grounds, the Rani's street. You know, she used to keep telling us that we just had the same training as the men, you know. And, and she also had administrative work to do. But they worked very hard. I mean, they and they had very minimum facilities, very spartan. But they were always in such a state of excitement. They were writing plays and doing skits and putting up plays and singing songs. There was a lot of cultural activity that went on. And she also wrote some play, I believe, and it was performed for Detaji in the first... इवनिंग दैट दे ऑर्गेनाइज फॉर हिम बहुत गर्व महसूस होता था और उस समय ये चिंता बिल्कुल नहीं रहती थी कि हमको क्या होगा केवल सबके साथ बढ़कर और ज्यादा से ज्यादा काम करने के लिए हरदम प्रेरित रहते थे कोशिश करते थे कि मैं और क्या कर दूंगा और क्या कर दूंगा रात को नींद लगती थी न कोई थकान महसूस होती थी ये माता जी का हमारा कहना था Her stories only started coming out in the later part of her life. The main story that I was quite overwhelmed with was uh, the care and the um, concern that Netanji had for the um, Rani's. He used to come very often to see how the training was going on, and he was very, very strict about. no miss uh, behavior with women so these were you know the people used to come to train them they were all just typical indian army men from rural backgrounds you know, but they were all absolutely you know on their best behavior and there was no incident of any rudeness even speaking about them in a derogatory way was just not permitted my mother was very influenced by his uh, openness and acceptance of um uh everyone uh, she felt that was the greatest strength that netaji had this openness of spirit mm what else can i say Netaji wanted the women's regiment to be as professional as the other regiments in every way. By late 1943, the saris of the ranis had been replaced by a smart uniform. Jodhpurs with tucked in bush shirts, black buckled shoes, a cap covering their now short hair. Their training became more rigorous and their courage and conviction grew with every passing day. The Rani of Chhatri Regiment soldiers were extraordinarily keen to fight in the last war of Indian independence on Indian soil. Indeed, at the beginning of 1944, uh, the Rani of Chhatri Regiment soldiers sent uh, a letter in the form of a petition written in their own blood to Netaji asking to be sent to the front. Other than my mother Nobody in the Rani of Jhansi regiment had ever been to in India but their feelings were so strong because of their ancestry 
that they were ready to die for India, Indian freedom, which is such an inspiring thought today, you know. Here are these young women from ordinary families, poor families, who were just ready to give up everything. Of course, this also was a tremendously emancipatory thing for them. The desire of the Rani's to fight in India could not be fulfilled because of the turn of events in the war. But the Rani of Jhansi Regiment played a unique and significant part in the annals of the Azad Hind Forge. Netaji assumed the role of the Supreme Commander of the Azad Hind Forge on 25th August 1943. He placed the 1st Division of the INA of 10,000 soldiers under Major General Muhammad Zamar Kiani, the senior-most field officer of the INA. This division consisted mainly of professional soldiers, but the Indian National Army also comprised civilians residing in Southeast Asia, civilians who had responded to Netaji's call for action. Muhammad Zaman Kiani has written in his memoir that these civilian volunteers, many of whom were Tamil-speaking, you know, plantation laborers before they joined the movement and its army, that these civilian volunteers, although they were not professional soldiers, acquitted themselves very creditably in very difficult circumstances in the fighting in Northeast India and also in Burma. They proved to be as tough if not even tougher than the soldiers of the INA from a professional military background. After starting work on the army, Netaji then set out on a whirlwind tour of various parts of Southeast Asia. He appealed to the people of Indian origin to come forward and contribute to the cause. People fied with each other to give away everything they had in response to his call. नारी जी जो हमारी थी वो जैसे जब नेता जी डोनेशन मांगे कि हमको जरूरत पड़ेगी हथियार खरीदने के लिए यूनिफॉर्म खाना के लिए पैसों की जरूरत पड़ेगी तो उन्होंने अपना सर्वस्व निछावर कर दिया जितना भी उनके पास सोने गहने थे सब निकाल के दे दिए माय मदर इन लॉ वाज द सेक्रेटरी ऑफ सुभाष चंद्र बोस एक्चुअली so she traveled with him when my husband was a little boy. She left him uh, with the helpers and then she traveled with him all over. Another interesting story is that of the wealthy Chettiar community in Singapore, as narrated by Abid Hassan, Netaji's close aide. The Chettiars had invited Netaji to grace their temple on the occasion of Navratri. Netaji agreed on one condition. He asked that the doors of the temple be opened on that occasion to soldiers of every religion in the Indian National Army, a condition the Chettiars unhesitatingly agreed to. This stance of Netaji was reflected in the day-to-day -day functioning of the Indian National Army as well. The INA was like a showcase of uh, national unity. Uh, it included Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and Christians at all levels, from the senior officers, you know, down to the Jawans, um, the ordinary soldiers. And it included uh, men and women from all regions and communities of India, working together in complete harmony in a common cause, that is India's freedom. This unity was evident in all the training camps of the INA. A simple form of Hindustani was taught to all the soldiers. There were no separate kitchens and everyone took food together without distinction of caste or religion. Netaji himself never made a public display of his religion. Faith was to him an intensely personal affair. Just his simple daily prayers at the crack of dawn. And when he could, a visit to the Ramakrishna mission in Singapore. He would change from his military attire to a silk dhoti and meditate for an hour or two in the shrine. These were probably the only moments of respite that he had 
in an otherwise grueling schedule. His residence was in Mayer Road, located in the eastern part of Singapore. It was here that he worked tirelessly on the military and administrative aspects of the Indian National Army. When he was satisfied that the INA had been thoroughly organized, Post took the next logical step. On the 21st of October 1943, Netaji proclaimed the first provisional government of free India outside India in Singapore, the Arzi Hukumate Azad Hind. A historic moment in the Indian freedom struggle that also unfolded at the Cathay building. The tricolour with the Gandhian Charka was adopted as the national flag. The cabinet was formed with Netaji as the Prime Minister and Minister of War and Foreign Affairs. An interesting story unfolded at this time in a distant corner of Singapore. The story behind the creation of the national anthem of the Provisional Government of Free India that was adopted by Netaji and his colleagues of the INA. Janaganamana by Rabindranath Tagore was their first choice for an anthem. Netaji agreed with them, but he wanted one thing changed. He wanted the words to be in simple Hindustani. Colonel Abid Hassan, his colleague Sayyid Mumtaz Hussain, and Ram Singh Thakur, the music director of the INA's orchestra, took up the challenge. They went to a quiet spot outside the city limits of Singapore. Accompanying them were a few soldier musicians of the INA, and they started work on the song. The anthem that they composed was performed henceforth at all meetings of the INA. Its adoption as an anthem song carried due weight when India became independent and adopted Janagana Mana as originally created by Tagore as the national anthem of India. On October 24, Netaji addressed an audience of over 50,000 Indians on the Padang. He announced that the provisional government of Azad Hind had declared war on Britain and America. And when I say war, he roared, I mean war. War to the finish. A war that can only end in the freedom of India. As the soldiers raised their bayonets and shouted revolutionary slogans, the crowds went into a frenzy. They broke the cordon and surged towards the platform where Netaji stood, cheering him till their throats went hoarse. After this declaration, Netaji travelled extensively, seeking and receiving the support of several Asian nations for the Azad Hind government. And then, as a prelude to the war that was to be launched from the northeast frontier of India, Netaji moved the headquarters of the INA and the Azad Hind government to Rangoon, present-day Yangon. Netaji also established the Azad Hind Bank in Rangoon to manage funds donated by the Indian community. A very important role in raising these funds was played by Attavar Yelappa. Dr. Lakshmi has said of him that he single-handedly collected large sums of money from Natukotai Chettiars in Malaya and Burma, as also from Sindhi and Sikh businessmen. Well, the Azad Hind Bank was a unique institution because it, uh, it created a currency that was backed by gold and uh, the currency did not lose value. Now, in, in uh, the Jap Japanese-controlled parts of, uh, of Asia, uh, towards the end of the war, a lot of the currencies uh, lost value very quickly because they were printing too much money and uh, production wasn't keeping, uh, keeping up with the 
amount of currency being created. And so you had, an in, you had a significant inflation problem. But interestingly, because the uh, Azad Hind Bank's currency was backed by gold, it held its value much better. In fact, it, it, it basically held its value well. It ensured that the INA and the Provisional Government of Free India were independent of, ja of the Japanese. On March 18, 1944, the INA crossed the Indo-Burma frontier towards Imphal and Kohima and took the battle for freedom onto Indian soil. The INA fought bravely for over four months. But the tide of the war eventually turned against them, and they were forced to retreat. Netaji kept the war effort going, traveling tirelessly across Southeast Asia. On July 8th, he laid the foundation stone of the INA Martyrs Memorial in Singapore. He entrusted the task of building it to Colonel John Stracy, an Anglo-Indian officer in the INA. Netaji's last public appearance in Singapore was at a play on the life of Rani Lakshmibai of Jhansi, enacted by members of the Women's Regiment. At the end of the performance, he sang the national anthem. And the 3,000 men and women of the INA, assembled in the open-air theatre, sang along with him. the soldier who wore this uniform was one of those who sang the national anthem along with Netaji that evening. You know what, Janet? If only these pictures could speak, they would tell us many more stories of a man who gave a sense of purpose and direction to an entire generation of Indians who lived here but fought for the land of their forefathers. Thank you so much, Uncle Selva, for sharing this amazing saga with me. This will definitely be one of my most cherished memories of Singapore. Three people who were tried. One was a Hindu, one was a Muslim, and one was a Sikh. If uh, you needed unifying heroes, that you couldn't have asked for uh, better than this. And then the trial itself, being in the Red Fort, it was so historic because Bahadur Shah Zafar had also been tried there. The Mughal Emperor, who was uh, treated as the leader of the mutiny by the mutineers, so all of that, you know, rubbed off to them. And then the trial itself, it got the immense amount of publicity because then you know they had a galaxy of lawyers from Pulabai Desai to Sapru and of course then so Jawaharlal Nehru himself coming and attending the trial and Gandhiji used to go regularly to the barracks and meet the soldiers. The trial was very critical because until the trial happened nobody in India knew that there was such a thing as the INA. They knew about Subhash Chandra Bose, they didn't know where he had gone. But they didn't know that there was actually a fa an army of Indians, including Indian women, that was fighting the British in Southeast Asia. They knew nothing about this. But during the trial, every day, the whole country and all the newspapers were full of the stories of the INA's battles, the battles they had won and lost. So the trial just opened people's eyes to this and people went completely insane, you know with excitement and they were just determined not to let these people be hanged. Once the stories about the INA became public, 
it is no longer possible for Britain to hold on to India. Shiva 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 Shiva